So we're going to talk about data structures, specifically three separate data structures. In the slides, I'm just going to go over the very, uh, very quick syntax. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll go to the code and see some examples with some more uh, application of it. Which week do you think the course will increase in difficulty? I mean, m most weeks, at least until about the halfway point in the semester. Then things start leveling off and even getting a little easier towards the end. Uh, I'd say the hardest part of this course is uh, is right in the middle, right in the, the center. Some of the OOP and FP topics. And then the data structures and algorithms is a little bit of a, the course lets off a little bit. Uh, and I mean, they're all they're all hard in different ways, though. All right, so let's talk about some data structures. So the third objective that we're doing here, again, you should not have the testing done for any of these learning objectives. On Wednesday, we'll introduce testing. The learn the lecture objective on Wednesday is actually to do the testing for lecture objectives one, two, and three. So don't panic that you don't have these objectives complete in Autolab. You shouldn't have the testing complete yet. Uh, so the code for learn lecture objective three is to write the city populations method, which takes as parameters a country code and a region code and returns a map containing the populations of all the cities in that region of that country. Uh, so this uh, requires understanding this cities.csv format, what data is in there, and then parsing that data to get the information that we want. Uh, for this, you don't have to worry about upper or lowercase at all. You shouldn't be calling two uppercase or two lowercase anywhere in this code. You can assume the country code and the region code appear exactly as they do in that file. So as you're iterating line by line, check this line. If the line's country code matches exactly the input from of this method and the region code matches exactly the input of the method, then I have a city that's in the region that I'm concerned with. Then we want to add that to the map, take the name of that city, and add that as a key to the map, mapping to its population that you read from the file, and then return that map after you've read through the entire, uh, the entire file. Yeah, and that's fine. I'll reiterate, it's, it's fine if you didn't complete lecture objective two. And when I say that, I'll say if you haven't done the lecture objective by now, you know, you're, you're falling behind in the class. Uh, I don't mean that too literally. As long as you've given an honest effort, and especially if you know generally how to approach the lecture objective, you just haven't been able to carve out enough time in your schedule to actually complete it yet. Uh, you know, that that's fine. You can easily recover from that. Uh, but if you haven't even tried, the reason I say that and I say it in, in those terms is if you haven't even attempted lecture objective two by now, you're definitely falling behind in the class. If you're not keeping up with the content, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube like a week after I the, the live recording, uh, you're definitely behind. Those are the students that I really want to want to call out and be like, look, you're falling behind and you're probably going to fail if you keep this up. Those That's what I'm saying. If you've attempted Lecture Objective 2 but just weren't able to get it done by now, you're fine. Don't, don't worry. Don't stress. Just keep putting in the hours. Keep working. You'll get there. Where can I find the slides for today's lecture, bad boy? At least, at least get better at what you do. <laughs> like, where can you find the slides? Uh, data. If anybody else has that question, I'll give it a serious answer. But uh, let's talk about some data structures. So there are a lot of data structures in Scala. We're only going to talk about a handful of them, and for most of the semester, we're only going to use list and map. But there are tons of data structures. These are all different data structures that exist in Scala, at least the ones in the gray boxes. Uh, the ones in the blue boxes are abstract. And uh, and I don't want to scare you with this slide. That I'm just showing you that there's a lot in this language uh, that we're not going to use explicitly in this semester. But down the road, like you have an entire course called data structures. You're going to learn about a lot of these other data structures, how they're used, why they're used, uh, why they exist, things like that. Um, that's not for this class, uh, but suffice to know that there's a lot more out there in the world of data structures that we're not going to talk about in this course. I'm going to save that for, for 250. So let's just focus on these three. Array, we've already seen. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit. Uh, we won't use array much in this class, but we will use it when we have to, and specifically when, the, when we call string.split. 
that's going to return an array. Since that returns an array, we kind of have no choice but to use an array just a little bit. Uh, but we won't create arrays. I won't have you create an array, return an array, or anything like that in this class. So arrays, lists, and maps we'll talk about it and use uh, in depth. So an array is one continuous block of memory. And when we talk about memory, and especially uh, learning objective four, we'll talk about the implications of that a lot more. Uh, but an array is one continuous block of memory in your RAM. And we can access by, uh, elements in an array by index. So to find the address, the memory address for an index, you take the memory address of the first element in this array and add the size of each element in bytes multiplied by the index. So if index is zero, for example, this is zero, and you just have the element, uh, the address for the first element, and you get that address for the first element. So the array, uh, the value at index zero does have actual meaning. It's not just because we like counting it from zero, but if we have this as zero, it's gonna make the math work out for this equation. Index zero is gonna be the first address one. Okay, we get started the first address and add the element size. If we want the third element, this is a two. We add two elements, we jump two, uh, the size of two elements in memory and, uh, and so forth. So we have a quick way to get the exact memory address and we call this random access. We can just access directly any element in the array very efficiently which is nice for arrays. Uh, this is also a fixed size data structure. If you have an array in your code, you cannot change the size of the array. You can't add an element to the end of an array. You can't make an array of size 10, an array of size 11 by adding an element to it. Uh, it's just something arrays can't do. Some languages have classes called arrays that add functionality to it and actually recreate new arrays with larger size and do a lot of stuff under the hood. But a plain old array, cannot change size. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we won't use them in this class. Uh, so to work with an array, again, we won't really create arrays in this class, but if you wanted to, this is the syntax for it. Uh, array, and then in parentheses, a list of values that you want in that array. And since Scala is strongly typed, for each data structure that we create, we also have to specify the type that that data structure contains. And that data structure can only contain elements of that type. So if I create an array of integers, this array can only store integers. I cannot, if I had a point O on this four and had that as a double or a point one, this would cause an error. My code would crash. It wouldn't run. We have to have specify the type and we have to hold to that type. And this is what's called the type parameter. I'm creating an array of that stores ints. So I, and I create the array, give it some ints, and I have an array of ints. To change the value at any index, we use this parentheses syntax. In other languages, we'll use, we use uh, brackets here. In Scala, parentheses, because that's actually a function call or a method call in Scala. Uh, we use parentheses for that stuff. Uh, so we can change the value at an array. We can access the value at an array, at, at an index with the same syntax. We can iterate over our values like we saw in the last lecture. We're gonna create some variable name and then iterate over all the values in our data structure. So this loop, this body of the loop is going to be executed once for each element in the array. And we're gonna call this code with the element stored at this variable element. So we have an array, two, three, four. This element actually uh, 224 at this point. Element is going to be assigned two, code executes. Element is going to be assigned 20, code executes. Element is going to be assigned four, code executes. So it loops just like we've seen in 115, just like we saw on Friday. We can iterate over an array and execute this loop for each value in that array. If we want to iterate over the indices instead of the values, we had some applications in, uh, in 115 where we needed the actual index that contained a value, not the value itself. So if we want to iterate over the indices, there are a few ways to do it. The cleanest one is this way, array.indices is going to give you a data structure containing those indices. Or we can use the methods that we saw on Friday. We can use this 0, 2, use this 2 method like we saw that returns a range. The array length minus 1 to iterate over the indices. 2 includes the endpoint. 
We could also use until. We could do zero until array dot length, which is going to exclude the endpoint if you just don't want to have that minus one, uh, minus one in there. The big thing here, the one thing that you really need to know, uh, is this accessing the specific value at an array. That's something you you had to do for lecture objective two. And you have to do for a few other lecture objectives, getting the specific value from an array. This is the syntax that you want for that. So as you're parsing your CSV, you split your string on a delimiter, and you have this array of strings containing all of the delimited pieces of information from that CSV line. You're going, you can use this syntax to access each value at its indice. So uh, in this case, array of zero to get the first element in that CSV row, array of one to get the second, array of two to get the third, etc. Yeah, and we'll use, so we won't really parse CSV, the format CSV, we won't parse in this class, uh, just because I don't have an application for that in mind, uh, so we don't have to, um, but we can use dot .split since we won't be using the full CSV format. There are no escaped characters or double quotes in the CSV file that we have to parse the city CSV file. Since there's no no escaped data in that file, we can use just dot .split on comma. We're not going to do full parsing of CSV. Feel free to if you want. If you want to use the um, a CSV parser that's included in Scala, uh, feel free. But we're not going to parse the entire format, the entire CSV format. All right. So this is arrays. This is actually all I'm going to talk about for arrays. No CSV. The dog's chewing on something right behind me. Hopefully that's not too distracting. Yeah, your dog. Are we going to use a database? Um, I might mention databases towards the end, but you're not going to have to use them for any of the projects, right? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not requiring that. Uh, I've required databases in this class before, and it was too much of a distraction and too much other content that we have to cover. All right, let's keep going. Lists. Lists are sequential, just like arrays, but instead of being one continuous block of memory. There, the the data is spread across memory. So when you have a list, uh, in what we call a linked list, which is something we'll explore in depth in LO4, uh, a list we actually have pieces of information, uh, chunk not chunks of the data, but each element is anywhere in memory, and each element knows the the value that it stores, and also where the next element in the list can be found. So we can bounce all around memory and navigate this entire list, but it's not all in one spot. The list isn't contained in one uh, one spot. So there are a few implications of this. One, if we want like the fifth element in the list, we actually have to bounce all over memory to get that value. So it's a less efficient than random access, uh, but it does give us variable size. It's easy to add an element to the beginning of a list and then have it refer to the old beginning of the list or to the end of the list and have the old end refer to the end list, end of the list. Uh, we can easily change the size of this list. We can even insert in the middle of a linked list, and that's plenty efficient. It's actually inefficient in with Scala's list, but it's some uh, topic for another day. Don't go into the moon. May, yeah, if the dog's still up here, I might show him after lecture, but I want to take up lecture time. Uh, the syntax for a list, a lot of it is somewhat similar to an array, but a few big differences. One, we can, since we can append and prepend, since those methods didn't exist in in arrays, of course, that's going to be a new, uh, some new syntax. Creating a list, very similar syntax. I, I'd say even identical, except list instead of array. To create a list, you do have to specify your type, the type that this list will store. If we want to access the first element of a list, we can do list.head. Head is is uh, always refers to the first element in a linked list. If we want to access any other elements in the list, we can use the apply method, which is a, 
which has the same functionality as uh, as accessing an element by index in an array, but underneath the hood, uh, behind the scenes, apply has a much uh, much different functionality than uh, than getting a value at an index for an array. Uh, it does support the same syntax, so even in the uh, so even in the code that I gave you for pale blue dot, I'll actually use list of one for uh, for these applications instead of calling dot apply directly. If you do list of one, it calls dot apply for you. It's just a little bit of shorthand to be able to get that, but you are calling a dot apply method when you do that. Uh, so to get the first element, you can do apply of zero, uh, or you can do dot head. Apply of zero is also going to give you the, the head of the element. Of course, IntelliJ will be like, hey, you know, you can use dot head. Uh, so if you use dot head, it gets rid of all that yellow highlighting that IntelliJ will give you because it's uh, it's just better practice to use that than apply of zero. If you want to append an element to an end, the end of a list, colon plus is the syntax, and this is just something we'll have to remember, or refer to these slides as reference, or refer, refer to the Scala documentation as reference. Uh, this is just something you got to know. Uh, colon plus, not that I'll quiz you on it, but when you're writing your code, you got to look this up each time until you memorize it. Colon plus to append to the end of a list, and colon colon to prepend to the beginning of the list. And the elements have to be in the order that they're going to appear. So list, and then at the end is 50. 50 has to, has to be after. With colon colon, 70 is going to be before the rest of the list. So colon colon. I'm going to mention this a over and over again until everybody never makes this mistake. But when you change a list, whenever you modify a list or a map, as we'll see, you have to reassign the result to the list, to your variable storing the list. So you have to reassign this. This is actually not going to add, append 50 to the end of list, to the end of this list. It's actually going to create a brand new list with the element 50 appended to the end of it. Since this creates a brand new list n without modifying this list, we have to reassign it to that variable if we want to if we want to see that change at all. So list equals instead of re equaling this list, list is going to equal this new list that was created, which is this list plus 50 appended to the end. Reassign that variable or uh, reassign that variable or you're not going to see that change at all. Always reassign. Same with prepend. Same with any time you modify a list, you have to reassign to that list. Always reassign. Always, always, always. That's something worth spending time on. I'll mention it a lot because uh, uh, I it's one of the most common errors when your students are first learning data structures in Scala. It's one of the most common errors I see in office hours is they don't have the list equals. It's just list colon plus 50 and nothing works, and they're wondering why they're not getting any uh, any functionality out of their methods. It's because you got to reassign to the list. Uh, you can't modify. You actually can never modify a list. Once it's created, you can only create new lists. Uh, we see the same behavior with strings. Whenever you modify a string, it doesn't actually change that string. It creates a new string with the change made to it. So you have to re uh, reassign to the variable that you want. Uh, and that's... Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Yellow dozer. It's because of uh, well, lists, at least. It's because lists are immutable in Scala. Uh, so since this is immutable, and strings in a lot of languages are immutable as well. Since it's immutable, it means you cannot change it. So you have to reassign whenever you have a change, whenever you want to see a change. Scala strongly typed is already printed forever in your head. Nice. Good, good. Uh, and iteration, same as we saw before. I got nothing new to add to that. Uh, maps are also immutable. I'll use that as my segue. And maps are a key value store uh, data structure. So this is like dictionary in Python. This is like object in JavaScript. This is our key value store. And they behave a lot like those key value stores that you saw in 115, but with, of course, syntax differences. Uh, uh, with some syntax differences that we'll talk about. So keys mapping to values, and we use the keys instead of indices. 
where like an array, we have indices 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and we can't change that, that's always what the indices are. With a map, if we want something other than 0 through length minus 1 as our indices, we can use keys as our indices effectively uh, for a key value store. So um, uh, this, uh, I don't even want to mention that, but but it definitely technically uses a, technically is a hash map. That's why, where it gets the name from. Uh, and here we get variable size and variable values as long as we reassign back to our variable uh, that we uh, that we have. Uh, and we cannot have duplicate keys. You cannot have duplicate keys. Hopefully this is something you're familiar with from 115. But you cannot have duplicate keys in a map. So if you try to add something to a map with a key that already exists in the map, the old data is overwritten. You can't have duplicate keys in a map. Syntax, here's where we got to talk about a little bit different syntax than the other two. Since a map has keys and values, we have to have two type parameters. Uh, in this case, I'm going to map ints to ints. This means the keys have to be of type int and the values have to be of type int. These can be two different types. I have them both ints in this example. Uh, when I go to the code, we're going to see an example of int to string. Uh, but we do have to specify the type of both the keys and the values. To create a map, this is where the next place we're going to see that Scala developers just love arrows. A and, you know, working with Scala for a while now, I've become quite fond of arrows myself. So, uh, and when I say Scala developers, it's developers of the language itself is what I mean. Um, we're going to create a map and then give it a list of the key value pairs and to specify a key value pair, we specify the key arrow, which is a dash greater than, and then the value that we want this key to map to. So I have two mapping to four, three mapping to nine, and four mapping to 16. So I have a map of uh, integers mapping to their squares. If we want to add a key value pair, we use the plus sign. We add a key value pair to the existing map. And then just like the list, we have to reassign back to our variable to be able to actually reflect that change. The map is immutable. We cannot change this map. This map will always map 2 to 4, 3 to 9, 4 to 16. No other key value pairs and those values can't change. Nothing can change with this map ever. But we can create a new map with a change reflected. So if I take my map and add this to it, this map doesn't change, but I do get a brand new map with 5 map to 15 added to the map that I already have. And then I can reassign that new map back to my variable. So this variable is no longer referring to this map, but it's referring to the new map that I just created here. And I assign that to my variable so I can actually see that change. Without my map equals, if it's just my map plus 5 to 25, I won't ever be able to see that new map that was created because I haven't stored it in a variable. I just created the new map and then just walked away from it, left it on the ground, and didn't do anything with it. Scala is in the top 10 most used programming languages. It's So a few things about that because this question comes up a lot. Scala is based on the JVM. I, it, I think it's extremely easy to go from Scala, after you know Scala, to learn Java afterwards. The syntax is very similar since they both compile down to Java bytecode. Uh, learning Java after Scala is really easy, in my opinion. Uh, so, which is probably the number one language still used in industry, uh, at, at least with uh, more uh, more mature uh, companies that have been around longer. Not necessarily mature, but companies that have been around longer. Uh, startups are using other languages now. Um, and Scala is on the rise. Scala is very... Uh, uh, Scala is building a lot of momentum right now. I think Scala is going to start, in my opinion, again, I think Scala is going to start taking over more and more market share uh, for what it's worth. Even without either of those things, Scala is still good as an educational lesson to teach the 116 topics that we have to cover. Uh, but as it happens, it's still good, uh, still good for industry, even if you're not working somewhere that uses Scala directly. Uh, so anyway... Uh, just because I get that question a lot, I wanted to take a second to talk about it. Uh, to access a value at a key, same syntax we were using for arrays, just access the key using this parentheses syntax. Uh, so this is getting the value at the key 3, 
which is going to return 9 in this case. So we get the value 9, which will, which will be stored in X. This will crash if this key is not in the map. So if we're trying to look up something in a map, and that key that we're trying to look up does not exist in that map, program crashes. Autolab gives you a zero. You know, everything, everything goes downhill from there. If you want to avoid that, which you should, you can use this get or else method. This is going to get the value at a specific key, 100 in this case, which does not exist in the map. That key does not exist in the map. So if that key does not exist in the map, it's going to give you return whatever the second argument is that you give. So here I gave it negative 1 as a second argument, which is going to be a default value. That's what's returned if the key does not exist in the map. So here, 100 does not exist in the map, so this is going to return negative 1, because I told it to return negative 1 if it can't find that key. So y is going to store negative 1 in this case. So this is a safer way to check for a value in a map, because it won't crash. It's not going to crash when you, uh, uh, when you call this with a key that's not in the map. And iterating over a map, a little bit different too. There are different ways to iterate over this. You, we can do it in the same way as 115. You can do mymap.keys, mymap.values, and iterate over either the keys or the values. For my money, I like doing this since Scala supports this syntax, is iterate over both at the same time. Just iterate over the key value pairs. You can iterate over the key and value at the same time in the map. So this is for key and value in my map iterate. And now I have access to both. Even if I don't use both, even if I'm just concerned with the values or just concerned with the keys, I'll iterate over both just because why not make all this data accessible to me? Uh, why not do that? Can we set y to a string and have it return false? No. Uh, so y has to match the value of the values of the map because if 100 existed in the map, this is going to return an int. So if it returns an int, if the key exists in the map, and a string, if it does not exist in the map, then what type should y be? It has to either be an int or a string. It can't be both. Uh, so we wouldn't be allowed to do that. We wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah, my dog's chewing on something. He's noisy over there. Yeah, these are just examples. All the examples I'll show today are... You know, they're just for example, so I can show off all the features of these data structures. We're going to examples in IntelliJ. Oops. Oops, oops, oops. I'm going to leave this in presentation. So we can talk about the lecture question after this. Let's jump over to IntelliJ and see a couple other examples. I'll go through, through these fairly slow and interact with chat. I like doing that when I'm showing examples. So I can get all the questions out there and answer all your questions. And for, so if you could believe this, this lecture and Friday's lecture used to be a single lecture and it was just light speed through the whole thing. Uh, so I split them into two lectures so we can slow down a little bit here. Even though Friday's was still very fast, I get to slow this one down a lot. I used to just rip through those slides at the end of Friday's lecture and be like, now you know data structures, let's move on to the next thing on Monday. So we, we're slowing this down a bit. What if the map has strings? What to do? Yeah, then the default value would be a string. The default, the type of the default value has to match the type of the values in the map. So if the map maps to strings, then the default value would be a string, which actually is one of my examples here. Uh, where, oh, down here. Somewhere in here, get or else. So this is a map of int to string. So my default value in my get or else is a string. But it has to match the, uh, uh, it has to match that type. Uh, but let's go through some examples. I'll do, if he's still up here, I'll do dog reveal after lecture. I don't want to take lecture time up with that. Um, we got a lot of content to talk about. This lecture already goes pretty quick, even splitting it into two. Uh, so let's just go through this line by line and talk about what's happening with, uh, with this list. So we're going to use a list, create a list, and then do some modifications to it and work with it. And 
to get this example, this is actually the first thing we'll do in lab on Thursday. We'll do this again. Um, but I want to talk about it here. We can't talk about it enough. If you click, go to the examples repo, because these are brand new examples that you won't have in your repo. Click this button. Boop. If a dialog box comes up, click OK. And then you'll see this list example and map example that I uploaded to the repo today. And you can always click this button to get the latest code. Uh, the latest code that I have in the repo. So if you want to follow along with these examples, click this blue arrow. That's going to pull from the repo. It's going to pull all the latest changes that I've made to the repo. And so you can see these latest examples. So as I add examples throughout the semester, if you're like, he's going through something in lecture and I don't see that example, click this blue arrow, boom. It says all files up to date. That means I have all the latest code in the repo. So I'm going to create a list containing prime uh, containing prime numbers and let's just work with this list so three five seven when i create this list these are only three prime numbers i can think of and let's go through and uh talk about this actually i want to run this first so you can see the output at the bottom and i'm going to print the the current list at various times throughout the execution of this so i just want to print this out this is going to print out a list containing 357 in that order. And then I'm going to do our first modification to the list. I'm going to prepend. I'm going to prepend two. I'm going to prepend two to this list. So now once I prepend two, this is going to create a brand new list. This is going to create a brand new list containing all containing this list with the number two prepended to it. And then I want to reassign that to my primes. If I don't reassign, I don't see that change. So now I have a list that's two, three, four, five, seven stored in primes. I'm also going to append to the end and we have different syntax. Prepend is two colons. Append is colon plus. I'm going to append to the end of the list, the value 11, and then print that out again. So my second print statement here, I have two, three, five, seven, eleven. I've added new elements to this list and reassigned back to primes each time. If we don't reassign, this is what we have. Primes, I want to append 13, but I don't reassign, then I don't get 13 in my list. This is one of the most common errors I see when students are first learning data structures. I've said it about five times now. I might say it a couple more just to make sure I drive the point home. Primes, append three to the end. This creates a brand new list containing all the values of primes and 13 appended to the end. But then I don't store it in a variable anywhere. This does not modify primes. It does not modify this list at all. The list does not change. It creates a brand new list with the change affected. So since I didn't assign this to any variables, I didn't do anything with that new list that was created. I just walked away from that list. We did create a list containing 13, but since we didn't assign it to a variable, we can never use that list. We can't do anything with that list that was created. We just created it and walked away from it, left it laying on the floor, and primes still has 2 through 11 as the primes. Uh, so this 3 didn't have 13. Let's do it the right way. And then 4 has 13. You always have to reassign when you want the new variable. It's creating a new variable for the list of best practice. Not necessarily. Like if I, like should I do, like I could make these vales and do like primes to uh, create new variables each time. Uh, depends on the application. The, the biggest problem with this is you can't do that in a loop. So if you have a loop like you do for your, um, for your, lecture objective you have a map that you have to loop over the cities in the file and add to the map as you go uh, you can't do this you can't create a new variable for the, each time you change it because you don't know how many times you're going to change and update that data structure uh, so when you're in a loop you can't really do that uh, i like to just reassign the variable it's if you don't need the old list like i never need to use this list again after i append and prepend then I don't want to create a new variable for it. So print out four, we got 13. And we can also use shorthand syntax. I'll, use, I'll start using these a bit. 
So for example, if I have uh, var x of type int equals sev seven, I can use x plus equals three, and then x is going to be equal to 10. So this is the same as writing x equals x plus three. So if you haven't seen this before, uh, instead of writing x equals x plus three, we can shorten this syntax to plus equals, which is the same thing. It's the same thing as saying x equals x plus three. Uh, so this is something we can do with integers. And I'll show these in my examples sometimes. I'll show this the shorthand syntax sometimes. Uh, but these are identical. These do the same thing. We can do the same thing with our lists. Instead of saying primes equals primes with 17 appended, we can use the append notation and then an equals at the end and then 17. So this is going to append 17 to the end of primes and reassign to that variable primes. So this is equal to primes equals primes append 17. Same thing with prepend. I use the prepend syntax with equals. I'm going to prepend one, prepend zero. And then after all that, uh, depending on if I have use a plus or a colon here, it's going to append to the end or prepend to the beginning. And since I was careful with the way I did that, I'm going to have these primes in that in this specific order because I appended 17 to the end, one to the beginning, then zero to the beginning after one was appended or prepended. Uh, so I can have these in the right order. Uh, the or, or not necessarily the right order, but the order that I want. If we want to remove elements from a list, so for example, zero and one are not actually primes. That was an oops. I didn't mean to add those. Oh man. So we want to remove zero and one from our list of primes. Uh, for that, we use this drop method. If I do primes.drop2, that's going to remove the first two elements from the list and create a brand new list without those first two elements. And then reassign that to primes. So six, I just lost those first two elements and returned a list with the rest of the list after those first two elements are removed. I can also do this from the other end. If I use drop right, it's going to remove elements from the right end or the end of the linked list. So if I want to drop that 17, I want to drop just one element from the right, drop right, reassign, and then I lose that last element from the end of the list. Zero and one are not prime numbers. You are correct, sir, or madam. Uh, and... Let's look at this uh, this last bit. I want to, and this is more of what you'll, so this is a, a lot of syntax up there. This is more of what you'll be doing for your lecture objectives for this project, actually throughout the whole project, is you'll want to create a data structure through a loop. So here I'm creating an empty list. So for example, your lecture objective today, you'll create an empty map, and then you want to iterate over the cities file one city at a time add some logic, make some decisions, decisions, and then add elements uh, to that map as you iterate over that data inside of a loop. So if we want to add to a data structure inside a loop, we'll usually create an empty data structure, iterate over the values we want to iterate over. Here I'm going to iterate over all my primes, store those values in a value named prime number. And I want this list to contain all those primes in the same order I want to store their squares. So I'm going to append each time I iterate over a prime, I'm going to append that prime number squared. Now I could do math.pow comma two to square these, but that's going to return a double and then I can convert that to an int. That's just more work than saying prime number times prime number. Plus I have to worry about double truncation uh, at that point. So I'm just going to do prime number times prime number to square it. So now I have prime squared, which is exactly what we expect it to be. So I started with an empty list, and then for each prime number, append that prime number squared to this list. By the end of this for loop, I have a list containing all those primes squared, the square of all those primes. And say I want to iterate over both of these lists at the same time. This is something that, that causes some... Uh, you know, some trickery in Scala uh, made one of my lecture questions last semester way more difficult than I anticipated because students got tripped up on how to do this.
But if we want to iterate over two lists simultaneously, we can't use our typical for uh, variable name in data structure. We can't quite do that directly because how do we iterate over both of them at the same time? That's, that's kind of tricky. So we can simulate this a bit. There are other ways to do this, uh, better ways, honest, to, if I'm being honest. But this is the simplest way, is we'll iterate over the indices of one of these lists. Be very careful to make sure that the lists are the same size so we don't get an index out of bounds error. Uh, if we're iterating over, say, primes indices and prime squared has fewer elements, we're going to get an index out of bounds on prime squared at some point. So make sure that they're the same size. Iterate over the indices of one of them, and then access the value at that index each time for each iteration. So I'm going to get the prime number from the primes list, the prime squared from the prime squared list, and then print them both out to the screen with some information, just to show that I have access to the index and the value from both lists simultaneously. Uh, and this, just to show off this syntax, this will call apply. This will be the same thing. I can rerun this, and it's going to give me the same exact output if I access them like, like thus. Uh, if, where do you find these examples? Click this blue button in your examples repo, and they'll be in this Scala, this L01 Scala package. All right, any questions about lists really quick? I only got six minutes. So I want to get through the map, especially since that's all about your lecture question. Okay. Let's show some examples about map, too. So here, uh, oh, and worth mentioning, I have a main method that just calls my list example method, just because I don't like having code, a lot of code in main. Uh, during the map example, I take advantage of that a little more. I'm going to call my map example, which actually returns a map of int to string. And then I'm going to call the second method. I have two methods in this example uh, to actually work with that map, just to show moving a map around as parameters and method calls. Uh, so for what it's worth. Uh, so here, I want to create a map. We're going to use that syntax from the slides. But here, instead of a map of int to int, I'm going to use different types for the keys and values. The keys have to be ints. The values have to be strings. So I'm going to create a brand new map of int to string. And here, we can, in case you haven't seen this before, the first time I've seen this as a student, it tripped me up a bit. Uh, we can do it like this, all in one line. Uh, but Scala allows us to go multiple lines Oops, it's not gonna. It's not gonna work for me, is it? Uh, Scala allows us to do multiple lines. I tend to prefer. I tend to prefer this because it makes it easier to see where each key value pair starts and ends. Uh, so I'm using this multi-line functionality to be able to create my map on multiple lines. And as long as we don't hit the closing parenthesis, Scala is gonna assume that we're still adding key value pairs to this new map. And yeah, you can do that in, in other languages, but you probably haven't seen it in 115 just because you haven't done, I don't know, maybe you did see it in 115. What do I know? Uh, but uh, but I'm going to use that syntax because I think it's a lot cleaner to read what's going on here. So I'm creating a map with the key value pairs 0 to 0, 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 4 to 4, 5 to 5. Uh, so I want to get the, the int value mapped to its English name as a string. I print this out. Let me run this thing. I print this out, and you're going to see this information in any order. So recall that key value pairs are not ordered. So there's no meaningful order to these. Even though I added them in this order, in numerical order, uh, they're not going to be stored like that in this map, which is, you know, as I briefly mentioned in the slide, an actual hash map. Uh, so they're sorted in the order of their hash values, which isn't something we got to think about in this class. Uh, just suffice to know that the order is not meaningful to us. Uh, that order doesn't really give us any any meaningful information. So we print this. We get these key value pairs. We can see what's in our map. Uh, for your debugging purposes, we can see what's in there. Now let's add a key value pair. Let's add 3 mapping to 16. 
and add that key value pair. So we're going to use the plus sign. That means add this key value pair or create rather create a new map with this map and this key value pair added to it. So I'm going to have all these key value pairs plus this key value pair in a brand new map. And I have to say it with me, class, we have to reassign it to the variable if we want to ever see that change. So just like the list, we have to reassign to our variable to actually see this new key value pair in there. Uh, we can also use this shorthand. We have shorthand just following the same convention as before. Plus equals is going to add this, create a new map with this key value pair added and reassign to the variable. Then we can print this out and see that we got our two new key value pairs, which can be in any uh, in any order. We don't know where they're going to show up where it's when it's printed out. We don't know what in which order these are going to be iterated over. For example, we have a loop looping over our key value pairs. Uh, oh, thank you for saying it with me. That makes me so happy. Uh, so we don't know the order here that if we loop over these, we don't know the order. Um, but they'll all be in there. The data will be in there. Um, but oops, whoa, three does not map to should not map to sixteen. That doesn't make sense. We made another oops here. So let's fix our mistake. Uh, let's fix this. And what we're going to do is add a key value pair with three the int mapping to three the string. And since we can't have duplicate keys in a map, when you add a new key value pair with a key that already exists in the map it overwrites the old value. So this three to 16, this key value pair is going to be removed and this key value pair is going to replace it. We can't have duplicate keys in a map. So now we have number strings, which should have at three, should have one through six mapping to the appropriate strings. For if you have to drop a specific value, how do you do that? Oh my goodness, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, if we want to remove a key value pair, we use this minus. Again, we could do equals number strings minus. Or I'm using the shorthand right here and doing minus equals. Oops, where'd we go? Minus equals. And then the key that you want to remove. So I want to remove the key value pair with the key zero. So I do minus equals zero. That's going to create a new map with the key value pair with the key zero removed and then reassign it to my variable. And then at four, we have zero to zero removed. So if we want to remove a specific value in a map, remove it by its key. Iteration, iterate over the keys and values at the same time. This is exactly from my slides. And then we want to return this map that we created again out of, you know, in any order, whatever order Scala decides. And then if we want to return this map, this is something you have to do in your lecture objectives. This method returns a map of int to string. We've created a map of int to string. We've added values to it. We've messed around with this map. And then we want to make sure the last expression that's evaluated in this method is what we want to return. Well, if we have a variable that stores what we want to return, that variable itself, all by itself, is an expression that resolves to the value that it stores. So I'm just going to put number strings as the last line of my method to say number strings is going to be returned. Number strings is returned here. I'm going to call my number to string method with that map. This method takes a map as a parameter, a map of into strings as a parameter, and a number to look up in that map. I'm going to use get or else that number to get the string for 1, 2, 3, and 50. As a default value, if the number is not in the map, I'm going to return no conversion found. And when we call this, we get one, two, three, no conversion found because 50 is not in our map. Which brings us back to the lecture objective. City populations, you need to return a map of strings to ints, mapping city names to their population. So you're iterating through this file, and as you're iterating, whenever you find a city matching this country code and this region code, you want to add a key value pair to that map with the city name mapping to its population as an int. Add that key value pair to the map, and then after that loop is over, that last line of your code should be the name of your variable containing your map, so you can return that map.